Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship here as part of the Bethany Seminary community. We are gathered together today largely on Zoom with just a few of us here in Nycarry Chapel. But together, wherever we are, we are the body of Christ. Our message today will be offered by Scott Linton, a senior Master Divinity student here at Bethany in his final semester. We look forward to his senior sermon. Scott is a co-pastor of the Union Bridge Church of the Brethren in Maryland, where he co-pastors along with his wife, Brittany. Welcome, Scott. A few notes about our service. Following Scott's sermon, we will pause for just a few moments for a silent reflection to allow ourselves to sit with the message Scott has brought to us. Also in today's service, we will sing two songs. The first will be, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Afresh on Me. However, in our singing, I invite us to substitute for the word me, the word us, so that we sing, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Afresh on Us. We will sing this through two times. And as always, when we worship on Zoom, I invite you to keep your mic mics muted, but sing with a full heart and a full throat. Now I invite you to continue with me in the spirit of worship. The holy calls to us in many ways with many messages, calls of comfort, calls to listen, calls to repentance, calls to action. And when we respond, the call becomes a conversation, a holy conversation. And so I invite you this morning to come with ears and hearts open, listening, and ready to engage the holy. Will you begin by praying with me, please? Holy God, you speak to us in silence, in scripture, through the created world, and certainly through Jesus. Yet there are no limits to the ways you choose to communicate with us, only to the ways we choose to listen. O oh God, tune our hearts to hear your voice and our lives to sing and speak your grace. Let this time spent in worship today condition us to recognize you amid the clamor of the world and the calls for our attention and our allegiance. May we hear you, your voice, above all and among all, that we may follow your path of life, love, and light. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. In the name and way of Jesus, amen.
A reading from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not lay, lie down again. So he, he went back and laid down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he went up to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall speak, Lord, for your servant is, li speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lied down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. God bless the reading of this word. So when I first began the considering of what sermon I would give for my senior sermon at Bethany, I was sort of thinking of the culmination of everything that I had learned in my four and a half year time here at Bethany. It's probably not surprising that pretty quickly this became quite intimidating, and I pretty much threw that plan out of the window as soon as it started. And when I thought back, I thought maybe the better place to start is where my journey at Bethany began rather than where it ended. And so one of my pet peeves I'll share with you is when pastors take a lot of time to talk about themselves. But unfortunately, today I will be the hypocrite who takes a lot of time to talk about themselves, because I think that is where my journey here began. So I was at a youth retreat, an impact conference in Ocean City. I was with a group of high school guys that I had, been, had led for a number of years. And we were talking about the story of Peter walking on water where he briefly lost faith and then fell in. And the students all kind of asked me, well, why did Peter lose faith after he had actually already done it? I don't understand that. And I kind of laughed in their faces and said, you let me know when you want to start walking on water. More so than that, I went a little more over the top with the story and said, I promise you this, you will never see the day that I step my foot on water and step off of a perfectly good boat. It will not happen. It's amazing how words you say almost immediately get turned back against you. The entire next day of the conference, I spent in a wrestling match with God, a tennis match with God. I've thought about it many times what the different idea of what this battle was I have with God, because the best expression I can really think of is a, a series of Tyson fights. Some of you might not know what a Tyson fight means, but back when Mike Tyson was in his glory days, there used to be record box office after record box office, and then everybody complained because the, the match went like maybe a minute and it was over. I spent this entire day thinking of reasons why I was not called into ministry, because it seemed like God was saying, Son, it is time for you to get off the boat and start walking. Petrified of this whole thing, I spent hours at a time thinking of 
a reason I was not the right person. And the reason I kind of laughed with the tennis match analogy and some other things is almost instantly when I had come up with something to tell God, somebody nearby me, someone different every time, said something that affirmed the exact thing that I had just qualified as the reason that I was not called. Needless to say, I lost this battle very quickly. By the end of the conference, tears were pouring down my face. Uh, the, the youth that were with me were like, he must really be getting into this worship service. <laughs> and I had told God, I will commit to follow your calling. The next day, I went to work. About 10 a.m., sitting at my uh, cubicle, tears of dread starting pouring down my face as I thought to myself, what have I done? What have I done? The next step was for me to go figure out what to do. So I told one of my coworkers I needed to go home for the day, took some leave, went straight to my parents' house to talk to them. My pragmatic parents would of course be the ones to talk me down from the scenario. No, you have a good job. You're in a good situation in life. You don't want to do anything different. So I said, mom and dad, I feel like I'm having a calling. This isn't going well. I don't know what to do about it. And they kind of just looked at me and said, well, if God is calling you, you should be answering. Thank you, mom and dad, you're useless. <laughs> that is not the news that I was looking to hear. So I then began my next plan on how to put this whole thing off. I came up with the most convoluted structure in history of the seven pastors I needed to previously talk to, the five people I had previously worked with in ministry, and then a couple other steps along the way. Well, the very first person I talked to was a former Bethany alumni and a pastor at Effort at Church of the Brethren, Brian Messler, who was at Frederick at that time. Almost before I even got st started with talking to Brian about why I had asked him to lunch, he said, Scott, can I just pray with you for a minute? It's been on my heart that you may have received a calling. So I never actually really got to tell him the news. He had somehow already identified it. I then had almost an identical situation happen again the next day before it was like, okay, I get it. I get it. Obviously, something needs to happen here. So I began moving now into a convoluted plan of how to put off seminary, put off preaching as long as possible, and start looking at, I wanted the symbol. I wanted a sign. I wanted something to tell me what my next step was because I wasn't ready to make that next step. Well, my darling wife, who, is, uh, who was my girlfriend at the time, Brittany, a, also a proud Bethany alumni, told me, you should go to Bethany. I said, that's all fine and good. I'll do more research for now. I remember randomly bumping into Jeff Carter somewhere around this time too, um, away from Bethany. And I said, well, I want to look at some different seminaries. And I remember his response being like, there are other seminaries. So that was his little call in this time. Well, as I continued, I remember sharing with Brittany, I want a blinding flash of light that I cannot ignore. I want what the Apostle Paul had. So Brittany, without missing a beat, grabbed a Bethany mug and a flashlight and put it in my face. Well, that was not the line that could be ignored anymore. So I decided, okay, okay, I will go to Bethany and begin this journey. Something that always struck me about my experience post first receiving this overwhelming sense of call was that there were highs and that there were lows. One day I was overwhelmed by God, feeling this immense calling upon me and saying, yes, Lord, I will go if you lead me, basically going to the song we just sang. And another day, it was like, I am ruining my life. What am I doing? This feelings of desolation and consolation welling back and forth within me. And I don't know why I had never noticed it before, 
but our biblical calling stories seem to have a lot of the same. They're abbreviated from the version I just told, but when Moses sees a burning bush and goes to investigate a voice claiming to be from God, Moses is quick to point out his inadequacy. God, I am a poor speaker. I am not the one you want. Jeremiah hears the voice of God calling to him, acknowledges the voice in the call, and then says, but I am too young. Then we get to Samuel, who never takes the time to question God's call, but is so confused by what is happening to him during this evening that he repeatedly makes Eli, wakes Eli in the middle of the night asking, why, is, why are you calling me, Eli? Why are you calling? I am here to answer you, Master. I must confess that if I heard a voice that kept waking me in the night, I would probably start getting pretty annoyed with Brittany and assuming she was up to something and expressed to her, this really isn't funny. I need to get some sleep. <clears throat> but ultimately, Eli getting a sense of what is actually happening gives Samuel the advice, go back, lay down. If God calls you again, you answer and you do what the voice says. So Samuel answers God's call and agrees to follow. And they all live happily ever after. Oh, wait, that's not quite true. The call of Isaiah begins with Isaiah overwhelmingly calling out to God, use me, God. And then God gives him the good news that I want you to speak to the people and let them know that I am shutting their eyes, closing their ears, and cutting off their hearts, for they were wicked. Jeremiah answers the call and is told to rebuke Israel and rebuke Judah, for they were wicked in his eyes. And Samuel is told that Eli, the person who had just told him to follow God, Eli and his house will be punished for their blaspheming against God. The first task of Samuel is to rebuke an individual that had raised him, that was a father figure to him. Samuel was to rebuke the person that taught him everything he knew of the world, a person who by all accounts was kind and cared for Samuel. There are a few voices that I start noticing that appear repeatedly in these calling stories. A voice of authority, a voice of responsibility, and the one that I kind of am honing in on today, ultimately, a voice of justice. The idea of having a responsibility towards justice, it sounds awesome, right? It sounds great. We all love justice, hooray. Hooray for justice. At the very surface, I really do believe that most people in this world love the ideals of justice. It just seems that at some times, we don't want to recognize the injustice all around us or to recognize our own spreading of injustice in the entire process. A great challenge in these stories about calling is the heaviness of the burden placed on the individual being called. Samuel, you need to go call out your father figure, your master, Eli. Jeremiah, you basically need to call out your entire people. Isaiah, you're cutting people off. And then, of course, there's the Apostle Paul. By the way, you need to go start helping all the people you've been persecuting. A story I want to share. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared, at his, it shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare supper for the traveler. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the other poor man and prepared it for the one who would come. Some of you will no doubt immediately recognize the stories, other may not. 
The story is, frankly, sounds more like a parable to me, is spoken by Nathan to King David regarding David's infidelity and sending of Uriah the Hittite to the front line to be killed. The passage says that Nathan gave him the story. David burned with anger at the wicked man in the story, saying this man should be put to death for what he has done. He, demand, he deserves justice and demands justice. But he could not push back or realize that the story was about him. It required Nathan confronting David and illuminating the injustice of David's deeds for David to recognize his own wickedness. Many of us are so non-confrontational that we shudder at the thought of engaging conflict. But what we miss and what, what may be missed in the heaviness of this responsibility to speak out about injustice, that leads many of us to say, God, you have got the wrong person. I am not the one you want. Surely it is not me. I am too young. I am not a good speaker. I cannot do it. Is the invitation the invitation from God to start participating in a movement to affect change. A calling in many circumstances can seem initially like a burden, like something that we should be avoiding like the plague. Perhaps a better framing could be a calling is an invitation to participate in something different. A way to be transformed and to help transform this world by speaking about oppression, injustice, racism, inequality, sexism, and any other isms that I'm leaving out in this stretch, a calling can be an invitation to get off the sidelines and stop pretending everything is okay, but to do something about it. I really don't care who you are, if you seek out injustice in this world, you are going to find it. The question for all of us to answer is, what are you going to do about it? And what are we going to do about it? Brethren, God is calling. Let us answer the call.
go now, listening for the voice and following where it leads, seeking the heart of God always. Brethren, let us answer the call.